Hello everybody and welcome back to the Healthy Orange Movie Reviews, the show where we bring you film criticism that is honest, insightful, and not least of all fun. I'm your host, Bennett Campbell Ferguson, and what you are about to see is a discussion between me and my wonderful panel of film enthusiasts about our favorite films of all time. And we're back, and back to Max. What is your third choice? Uh, not third my ranking, third, but my third, third on the list. <laughs> my third movie is Kill Bill, and I condensed both volumes into one. Because really, it's one long story that... I asked if I could do that with Captain America, and he told me I couldn't. <laughs> no, I, ne I never said that. I said I was thinking about that, and then I said, actually, I changed my mind. You can do whatever you want. Now, I'm going to say this to argue because I love Cap. I feel like Cap is two movies because it's placed through time. Kill Bill really is one long story. It doesn't break it up. It's just this is where it starts, and it continues through this time until... Point A, point B. It's just okay. it's so long it would never fit in one movie, and Quentin Tarantino realized that at the beginning. It's like Breaking Dawn. We're gonna, we're, I'm gonna get pretend to be just a pair. Tarantino, how dare you? How dare you? Let's talk about good movies. Kill Bill. This is the happy space. This is the safe space, people. Uh, Kill Bill is great because it has a lot of it has all, all the things that Quentin Tarantino does. Again, he's making this far enough in his career. You know what to expect, but you know not to expect anything. Great dialogue. It's a revenge film. It's kind of a samurai film. It's and he does all the time hopping a little bit. Like at the beginning, the beginning is actually like a few months down the line, and Marvel's going to jump back to the past. There's some anime in it, but it tells this great story. And every time I watch it, I can't watch one without watching the other. And you think that Bill is this bad guy. And he kind of is. I mean, they're all kind of bad people. They're assassins, and one is the queen of the Japan's, like, underworld. Like, they're all kind of bad people, but they're just also people. And still my favorite part, if I had to pick one, would be Volume 2. It's the finale, and I feel like every time I watch it, I, again, kind of like Patrick, I feel like I gain something else from it. That last scene, every time she's lying on the floor, she's crying, and she's laughing, and... Just kind of crying again. I feel like every time I watch it, I'm like, I feel like I get it a little bit more. Like, the first time I was like, why is she laughing? Why? Then she's crying again? Like, she, then she just kind of leaves and it, it all makes sense. Like, I feel like, I'm like, wow, I'm a really tired adult. I feel like I kind of get it now. <laughs> but the best part is just between her and Bill, and it could have been very anticlimactic if you just described the scene to someone after all the stuff she goes through to get there, but it's really the meat of the whole movie, and why did he do this? And It's like, does he hate her? No, he loves her, and he did it out of love, but love makes you do stupid and crazy things, and at the same time, he's like, I was pissed off. I overreacted. Like, you overreacted? That was your explanation? Like, well, now that's not just my explanation, and then he goes into why, but it's just the simply... Okay, I overreacted. I'll give you that. <laughs> like, and it was just like, you, you overreacted. And I will say, uh, I don't really like the C word. I, it kind of is like, there's, it's a really vile word, but he uses it and it kind of makes you laugh. It cuts the tension and comes back to, you know, sometimes a word's a word and it can be used for good and for evil. And there's just so many great things and they mirror each other. It's just great. Check it out, Allie. Okay. <laughs> Put that on the list. I'm writing it down. Good. Is that, have you not seen Kill Bill? No. I listed off all my ten movies. She's only seen one of them. Yeah. I'm, I'm not gonna no judgment. <laughs> yeah, I was very sheltered as a child. Yeah. But I, I love it. It's my favorite Quentin Tarantino movie. Um, my next movie is also something that uh, kind of leaves me with something new every time. And it is Elizabeth Town, which is quite often what I refer to as my favorite movie of all time. Um, Elizabeth Town gets a really bad rap for kind of being the start of the manic pixie dream girl. <laughs> um, and th that definitely is a part of Elizabeth Town, but I think part, the big part of what makes it stand out so much to me and why I keep going back to it is A, the dark humor in it, which is hilarious. Um, but B is that I don't really see it as a romantic comedy. And I don't even really see it as 
a story that's about Orlando Bloom and Kirsten Dunst's characters. I think the real strength of Elizabethtown is that so much of it relies on these characters' relationships with other people in the movie. And really, the theme that I get out of it is just that, you know, so much of who we are is made up on our relationships with other people, is that you never really go through anything alone. There are always these other people around you, whether it's family or the random dude that you meet who's staying in the hotel room next to yours. Um, there are just so many great side characters in this movie, and I think that's really its biggest strength, is that it's not a movie about Orlando Bloom, it's a movie about Orlando Bloom and his family, and the way that they react to tragedy together, and the way that they do it individually, and the way that they support each other through things. Um, and really just, you know, in our importance to other people. It's, it, I don't think it relies heavily on Kirsten Dunst as the manic pixie dream girl. I think she, I think, I, I don't personally don't really see her character as falling into that stereotype as much as I think other people do. And I think a big part of that is that I kind of view her the way I do the rest of the characters is that they're all um, very almost, um, not quite caricatures, but they all stand out for one or two defining traits. Um, with a hinted at much deeper backstory, and I think that that is kind of why Claire's character uh, suffers so much um, in terms of other people's opinion is that she's not fully developed as an individual character, but nobody in that movie is, and they all rely on being developed in their relationships rather than, you know, in a deep backstory. So that's my defense of it, and I love it, and it's hilarious. And the cover of Free Bird will forever live on as my favorite version, <laughs> even, over, even over actual Leonard Skinner to Free Bird. I prefer the version in this movie. I have to agree with you. <laughs> there, is, there is something that can has to be said for a group of middle-aged dudes standing on the auditorium of a hotel ballroom, playing Freebird with the sprinklers going off, and an on-fire paper mache bird flying out over <laughs> the table. It's wow. great. I don't understand why more people don't love this movie. I just never saw it because I heard all the bad reviews, but the way you described it, I'm like, oh, that does sound like a good movie. It's you gave great. it a good case. Thank you. I just realized I forgot to talk about the music in Elizabeth Town. Sorry, keep going. <laughs> Freebird, you talked about Freebird. I did talk about Freebird. <laughs> yeah, Freebird. It's Cameron Crowe, it's got a great soundtrack. There you go. There you go. Right. Boom. Country. I think that's a, that's a typical thing, right? With all of our lists, we all like the music. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, and all of yeah. Uh, so, there's too much to say about this one, but, uh, so I don't even know where to start with the fall thing. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Nor have I. Okay, good. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pretty polarizing film. A lot of people don't like it uh, specifically for a reason why I like it. <laughs> uh, it's, it's difficult to, to narrow down. Uh, there's a lot of mystery in it, and I think they, built, they purposely built mystery in it. And, um, it plays with a lot of themes. Uh, No, I, don't even know you just got going. lost in the fountain of your brain. <laughs> I think what I what 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 I really like about this movie is that every time I return to it, it challenges me, and I never win. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's great. <laughs> and that makes me happy. <laughs> and it makes me think about the the themes that they're introducing in the film outside of the film, and that's probably why I like it. I mean, there's a side of me, of course, that likes films and how they work and film production, film directing, and everything. If I would, the side of me that uh, that really likes uh, constructing screenplays, I think this is a really good study into constructing narrative. And yeah. Just to find the audience. Yeah. Uh, it, it's yeah. It's very non-linear. Oh yeah. Uh, you can you can keep. It's like it, it teases you. It, it it brings you into it and it gets you there but you don't actually get there. <laughs> um, which is a comment on, on the subject matter itself, which is why the title is so fitting, because there's this thing, the fountain of youth, 
that we built this whole mythology around, and we, we think of it as this really real place. I mean, like how they yeah. used to think about it uh, in the old days, but it doesn't actually exist. You, you, you try to get to it, and it's just not there. Mm. And the screenplay plays into that as well, and into the audience. Uh, going into this nonlinear narrative stuff. Um, I'm surprised Aronofsky pulled that off. Yeah, is, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, if Aronofsky didn't do it, I would have expected someone like uh, Malik, David Lynch, or Kubrick to have done this kind of movie. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're definitely not. Which makes uh, Aronofsky's recent work even more disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> like, just, just an example of how real this movie is. Three narratives, one in the past, one in the present, one in the future, starts in the past, goes to the future, and then goes to the present. I mean, it's just... That's a great, that's a great way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. It's, it's not even really a story, but almost this, this, uh, this, you know, loop where everything is interconnected. It's more by, like, like images and, and feelings than any kind of logic, I feel. Hmm. Although it has its own dream logic. Sounds great. You convinced me. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mo. Um, this one, my third one, also has, like, a little bit of backstory. Um... During, uh, during 2010, summer 2010, I decided to give myself an education in film, which meant that every Saturday I would walk from my house in Seattle to Scarecrow Video, which was like a mile away, uh, rent something there, because Seattle still has a DVD rental place, um, and then come back and watch it. And there were a few movies or a few TV shows and in the end, like, there were two movies that really stuck with me. The first was Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, which almost made it on here, but uh, fell by the wayside. And the other one was The Big Lebowski. <laughs> and that's, that's definitely stuck around. Uh, it's, thinking about it, this is a movie that's like a masterpiece of failure, of <laughs> nothingness, of unfinishedness. Like, there's... There isn't really a plot because we get to the end, we find out there was no plot. <laughs> um, there's all these side there's like all these side stories. Like the dude comes across all these weird people in Los Angeles. We never find out how they resolve. We never find out like what happened with the kid who stole his car, with with Bunny and owing money to Jackie Treehorn, with uh, uh, with Maude's baby. None of that gets resolved. It's just here's some weirdness. We're gonna go, kind of get involved with it. Fuck it, let's go bowling. <laughs> um, but it works, and it works. It fits with the main character because he's kind of, he has this this sort of arrested development, this like unfinished, incomplete life. Because he's he doesn't have a job. He just spends his free time hanging around, bowling, driving, smoking pot. There's nothing much to it, but he's happy with it. He's content with it, and. The movie fits it. The movie, like, Frames is not ideal, but it's, it's, there's zen to it. There have been books about, like, Buddhist philosophy in this movie. <laughs> um, what else was I going to talk about? Like, the, one of the weird things about it is that it's not, it's not traditional character development. Like, the dude doesn't develop. He doesn't change over the movie. He, he abides. <laughs> like we get to the end, and that was the big lesson. The dude abides. <laughs> and that's okay, but I've seen this movie so many times, and I've noticed he, the dude doesn't get development, but Walter does. Walter's the one who changes throughout the movie, because he starts off, he's belligerent, he's angry, he's, he'll fight anyone over anything. Shut the fuck and, up, Donnie! <laughs> and he'll never admit when he's wrong. Like, he's, he pulls a gun on a guy for, for like, bullying wrong, for breaking the rules. Yeah. And, and, he, and the dude keeps telling him, you can't be doing that, you can't wave the gun around. And he goes, am I wrong? Yeah. He was over the line, am I wrong? <laughs> and then, and we get to the end, and we get to the part where he, he's eulogizing Donnie. Uh, and he just starts talking about Vietnam. For no reason. <laughs> he pours out the ashes and they blow back in the dude's face. And the dude's like, what the fuck was that? What are you talking about with Vietnam? What does anything have to do with Vietnam? And Walter just goes, I'm sorry. And he's genuinely apologizing. He genuinely feels bad about something. And that's his change. <laughs> <laughs>
And the other one, the other one is when when the nihilists come out to them at the end and they torch the car, and they demand the money, and it's like you don't have the fucking girl, dipshit. We know he never did. <laughs> and they're just like, we still want the money. <laughs> and the dude, the dude, you've been on his side this whole movie, and he's just like, screw it, let's just pay them and be done with it. And Walter, you side with him because he says no. That's not the rules. We don't have to give you any money. Yes. And you and you're agreeing with him for the first time in the movie. And that's the shift. That's the change. Is you sympathize with Walter, and then he becomes sympathetic. 